What's up nerds and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then hello. My name's Erica and it's a pleasure to have you joining me today on the channel. Because for today's video, as you can see from the title, we are going to be discussing all things Euripides context. I am so excited. Oh my God, we're finally onto Euripides. It has been a long time coming. I have wanted to do this series since I started the channel and I've just been waiting for the right time for you guys to want it, but also for me to be ready to dive into these plays. And now we are here. But before we can get into all things Euripides and Drama Llama here on the channel, please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. And now that you have so kindly done that, Let's roll into the video. Euripides was born in 484 BC in Athens, and he died in 406 BC in Macedonia. Now that's important. Unfortunately, and I guess fortunately, all of these episodes about the playwrights are kind of linked. So in order to kind of get this one so that I'm not going over all the same points, do watch the one about Sophocles and the one about Aeschylus, because in each of them, I'm kind of explaining different things about theater in order to, you know, make these as short as possible. I don't wanna to have to go over all the same points again, but I do wanna highlight that Sophocles is only about a decade older, around about a decade, maybe 12 years older than Euripides. And so this is important to understand because their entire careers are really, really rivaled. And that is unbelievable context into understanding both of their playwriting abilities and how they were really pushing for change, how they were trying to really make the theater their own and how they were trying to carve out their own line when literally the other one is right behind them the entire time. Now this must've been a crazy time to exist. Like imagine going to the theater and getting a Sophocles plays, going to listen to those, going to watch those and be like, wow, those were phenomenal. And then the next day getting some Euripides plays or the next hour getting some Euripides plays. I mean, you are really contrasting two of the best playwrights to have ever existed in like the same week, the same day. What a time to be alive. Now, even though Sophocles was only about 10 years older, Euripides does die a few months prior to Sophocles. So Sophocles was, at least on record, he was said to be at the funeral of Euripides. He was said to honor him um, and to lead, I think he led some sort of ode, not really sure, I didn't write that down. It's not that important, but much like Sophocles, the life of Euripides is shrouded in mystery, much like I guess the life of Aeschylus. All of these ancient people are incredibly difficult to figure out who they actually were prior to them being the name underneath the job that we now know them for, if that makes sense. So it's really tricky to kind of figure out where did Euripides come from, who his family were. We can infer a bunch of things, same as the other two, same as with Aeschylus, same as with Sophocles, possibly because they're from a time of war was Euripides fighting in the war? Probably. Was he doing something, at least political, to further Athens? Probably. Uh, again, it's there's nothing written explicitly, but it's just because of the time period and what was expected and what we know of the patriarchal society that we can kind of, you know, fit these things together. We know he was probably from a well-off family, mainly because he couldn't have become the Euripides that we know him to be without having money in order to get him the correct education, to put him in the correct rooms in front of the correct people. And we know from references, we know from mentions of other plays and about these time periods, particular when you're submitting plays to be performed in competitions, because that's what they were for, if you don't know. As a playwright, you would write, in tragedy anyways, you would write four plays. So you'd have three, a trilogy of plays and one satire, and you would submit them. And then they would either be approved or denied from this particular competition. And then you would have those things performed, right? So Euripides is noted for having written 92 plays. That is crazy. Is it as much as Sophocles? No, but Sophocles did write 120. I know it as 124. I said in that video, it's around 120. This I'm pretty sure is like 92. That's at least the number that I was told. It's what I've seen mostly online. So not as many as Sophocles, but 92 is still a ridiculous amount of theater to produce. I think we can all agree. However, it is so unfortunate that Euripides is existing around this time period. And I will be going into what the plays are that survive because we only have a very small number of Euripides plays that actually survive to us 
to read significantly more than other playwrights, let's clarify that, but much less than 92. It's really unfortunate that Euripides is around this time because it meant that he was directly competing with Sophocles. And to spoil it, the audience much preferred Sophocles' plays. So Sophocles, having won around 24 victories, right, when it comes to performing for these incredible theatrical performances at these religious festivals, at the Dionysia, you, know, you show up at the Dionysia and it's like, boom, here's the play. People loved Sophocles. So he won 24 times, which means that even though we know Euripides got lots of honorable mentions, right? Like people literally were saying, oh, he deserved it or he should have won this year or whatever it is. And we know that he was probably pulled up to be one of like the top three or oh, something like 20 times or so. He only won four in his life. This man who's given us so much only won four because he existed at like the worst point in theatrical history to exist. It is just unfortunate, genuinely. <laughs> this is important not only for what I was saying, but also because as I mentioned at the start of this, Euripides did not die in Athens, which was his birthplace. He moved to Macedonia. Now that I know nowadays we all move around a lot, that's not that weird. In those times, it's weird to move from such a central hub of theatre, which is what he was doing, to move and to leave. And a lot of scholars do think that it's his disappointment with the reception of his plays that possibly made him leave Athens. Again, we don't know. It's not written down, but it certainly makes sense. Why would you leave? Why would you leave Athens if you're a playwright and then go and die in Macedonia? if it wasn't because your heart was completely broken and you were like, I'm a loser and so I must leave. Not saying that he thought he was a loser, but like, probably that's going through your head, right? Like, if you're producing such incredible pieces of theatre and you keep fucking losing, he only won four times, I would also leave. I completely understand Euripides. If that's the case, and obviously we don't know. So what's so interesting about the plays of Euripides? Right, what makes them different from Sophocles? Why now, even though he only won four awards, do we read them? What was so special about them that he got so much honorable mention? And why, if literally he was born in any other time period, would he have no doubt won everything? Well, Euripides' plays are really special. Though he does the same thing as essentially what Aeschylus and Sophocles did, which was take popular mythological characters and mythological stories and put them on stage, Euripides does two things, really. He is so fearless in the way he attacks these stories, but also he takes a completely different approach. Where most people want to take the hero and tell you the hero's story, Euripides will take the average. And that's not to say that the characters are average, but he will take the non-hero of the story and put them in front of you. He took Medea, for starters. He took Hecuba in one of his plays. I mean, he's always so brave in taking these characters that traditionally you wouldn't put as the star. You wouldn't put them as like, here's the most interesting person. Here's Medea. Bear in mind with Medea, there's so much analysis because when we're reading like Euripides' plays, you've got to bear in mind, like no one would have fucking known that she was going to kill her kids. That was a total way of Euripides just taking the story. And that's how he does the second thing. That's why he is so fearless because Euripides took these stories Again, Medea, perfect example. He took these stories that people know. Everyone knew Jason and the Argonauts, brilliant. But Medea is the character. Medea's the type of character, not Jason. That's weird. And then he would take these stories and spin them in a direction that no one saw coming. Like the creativity attached to Euripides is unmatched. He was the original reteller in the sense of what we understand as retelling. Obviously myth retellings were from the start of time. They were oral stories and you would tell them to somebody and then somebody would retell them. But in the way that we understand taking a story and reclaiming it, that was Euripides. Like that was Euripides taking these characters and saying, but what if Helen never went to the war? Okay, we get Medea back to Greece. But what if Jason then leaves her and then he has her kill her children? But you know, like minus that. I mean, the thought experiment behind it is phenomenal. What if you take Iphigenia and she isn't killed by Agamemnon? What if she's saved by Artemis and she goes and lives among the Taurians? I mean, the concept, the idea of this is just purely genius. And that is what made Euripides, still makes Euripides so incredibly fun to read, is his creativity with these plays, the way he can take a story that you think you know 
and basically say, buckle the fuck up, you're in for a ride. Unmatched, in my opinion. So what are these plays? Let's go a running list of the plays that we have of Euripides that survive to us. So look over at the screen, I'm gonna be writing them up with the dates. So we start off with Alcestis, that's 438 BC. Medea is next at 431. We then go into the Children of Heracles. This is a play that I know a number of you guys don't have to read, but it is fantastic. I might go into it. If you guys want me to do that play, let me know in the comments below. However, after the Children of Heracles, we go into Hippolytus, which is 428 BC. Andromache comes shortly after that, 425 BC. Hecuba or Hecabe, same name, just so that you guys know, because I always use them interchangeably. It is the same woman, the same queen of Troy. Hecuba or Hecube, you not, you, you not, you are not wrong, is what I tried to say. We then have the Suppliance, 223 BC. Heracles, 417 BC. Electra, eh, this date we don't really know. It's either 417 or around 414, one of the two BC. Trojan Women, 415 BC. Ion, I don't know anybody that has to read this play, but in case you do, it's around 412, 413, don't really know, sometime around then. Iphigenia Among the Taurians, 412 BC. Helen as well, 412 BC. Cyclops, this is really exciting. I know that you guys are probably gonna be like, why is this exciting, Erica? It's about one-eyed monsters. Yes, but it is a satire play. So we do have a surviving satire play. Phoenician Women comes next in 409 BC. We then have Orestes in 408 BC, Iphigenia at Aulis at 406 BC. Uh, this is a little bit of a confusing one because this is actually published after he died and so is the Bacchae. The reason why these two are a little bit tricky, we don't know if he wrote them or if he just finished them. We think at least for the Bacchae he wrote it and it just came out afterwards. It was just performed after he died. Uh, with Iphigenia at Aulis there is some questioning about maybe if he just finished it um, but it was actually like maybe his father's work or somebody else's work, or maybe like somebody else finished it for him, um, which, cause there's just a little bit ugh, analysis, little bits of differences in the Greek, but we don't really know. Both those plays do come out and are performed after Euripides has already died. Now there are a bunch of fragments from the lost Euripides plays as well. So we do get little bits of insight into what those would have looked like. And those include Telephus, the Cretans, Phython, Alexander, Oedipus, his version of Hypsipyle. You guys, when I found out that he had written a whole play about Hypsipyle, I nearly sobbed that it doesn't survive to us. Oh my God, one of the saddest things that we have lost, genuinely. And there's a play called Erechtheus. Um, there are lots of other ones, I won't lie. There are lots of other fragments. I think there are ooh, at least four or five other plays that are fragmentary. Uh, that do come from Euripides, but those are probably the ones that you have at least heard of, or if not, now you have. Yay! But that is everything that I really have to say about Euripides, just so that you guys know how this series will continue. I will actually start off by doing Medea and by doing the Bacchae. And the reason is, even though there are either ends of his publications, is because those are the two plays that you guys have requested the most from me over the last year. So we'll be summarizing both of those first. If you have to read any of the other ones for school, or if you're just wanting to read any of the other ones, even if it's one like Ion or something, I mean, that's completely fine. Let me know in the comments below and I will literally just be looking at the comments and tallying up who's requested what play to decide where I go next instead of doing every single one of Euripides' plays and every single one of all the playwrights. Lots of those videos don't tend to do as well. So that's how we're gonna do this from now on. I've picked the two most important ones that are definitely, definitely coming out. You don't need to request those. Anything else, leave in the comments below and I will be uploading as requested. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this context episode about Euripides. It means the world that you guys keep wanting to come on this journey through the ancient world, through the ancient plays and the books and the text and the material. And you guys choose Moan Inc. to help you do that. So I'll be seeing you guys next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. See you then.